All right. Thank you all so much for being here. We're really honored to be holding this event for everyone. And we're so excited for this fantastic group of organizers we have speaking today. Uh, my name is Mohammed Chek, and I'm the Campaigns Director of Critical Resistance, or CR for short. Um, I'm based on Huichin Ohlone Territory, commonly known as Oakland, California. And CR is a national organization working to abolish the prison industrial complex, or PIC, which is the overlapping interest between government and industry that use the interlocking systems of policing, imprisonment, and surveillance as solutions to political, social, and economic problems. So this year marks 25 years since our founding conference back in 98. And throughout the year, we're wanting to highlight the contributions and gains that CR and our allies have made over the years to advance PIC abolition. We're thrilled to be hosting this event today, Building and Winning Abolitionist Campaigns, where you'll get to hear from longtime organizers talk about campaigns against different parts of the PIC that they were part of organizing and ultimately winning. The last 10 years, and especially I would say the last three years uh, following the killing of George Floyd and the ensuing uprisings, have seen an unprecedented growth in the popularity of PIC abolition as a political framework. This is certainly a good thing, as more and more people are believing in and envisioning a world without policing, imprisonment, surveillance, and other systems of control. Yet, with the popularization of abolition, we also want to make sure that it remains grounded in its foundations as it continues to grow. And one of the core parts of that foundation is campaign organizing. So how do we wage strong and sustained campaigns that build power? What does it look like to develop effective abolition strategies? How do we contend with challenges and contradictions and actually win? So lucky for us today, we have three all-star organizers that have been at abolitionist organizing for a very, very long time. And they're going to share their insights with us today. And uh, before I go ahead and introduce our speakers, I just wanna go over some logistical things. So we're going to have each of our speakers talk about their campaigns. Um, and then from there, I'm going to open it up for a conversation. Um, that'll happen across the speakers that we have. And then we're planning to open it up for Q&A for everyone here in attendance after that. Um, attendees won't be able to use the chat, um, and that's primarily for some security reasons based on things that we've uh, dealt with in the past. But please do use the Q&A feature, um, which you should see at the bottom of your window. Um, and I see some folks have already started using it. Um, I also want to shout out our two wonderful ASL interpreters, Lixa and Lisa, for being available and willing to provide their services for us today. All right, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our three speakers, and we'll get to it. So. We have Rachel Herzen, who is an organizer, activist, and advocate fighting the violence of surveillance, policing, and imprisonment. Rachel was an executive director of the Center for Political Education, a resource for political organizations on the left and progressive social movements. She was co-director of Critical Resistance, a national organization dedicated to abolishing the PIC, and was Director of Research and Training at Creative Interventions, a community resource that developed interventions to interpersonal harm that do not rely on policing, imprisonment, or traditional social services. Next up, we have Judah Shett, who is a professor in the School of Justice Studies at Eastern Kentucky University. 
Grounded in the interdisciplinary field of critical prison studies, his work examines the history, political economy, and cultural logics of the carceral state. He is the author of Coal Cages Crisis, The Rise of the Prison Economy in Central Appalachia, and Progressive Punishment, Job Loss, Jail Growth, and the Neoliberal Logic of Carceral Expansion. He is the co-editor of The Jail is Everywhere, Fighting the New Geography of Mass Incarceration, his writing can also be found in journals such as Radical Criminology, Theoretical Criminology, Punishment in Society, Social Justice, Crime, Media, Culture, The Boston Review, Inquest, The New York Times. Judah serves as the book review editor for Social Justice, a journal of crime, conflict, and world order. And he has been active with numerous organizations and campaigns centered on decarceration, decriminalization and abolition. There's so many, so many accolades. Um, and lastly, we have Charlene Grace, who's the senior policy advisor at the law office, the Cook County Public Defender, where she helps develop and implement the public defender strategic goals. Prior to her current role, Charlene was a founding member of the Chicago Community Bond Fund and served as its first executive director until early 2021. Before joining the Bond Fund full time, she was the senior criminal justice policy analyst at Chicago Appleseed. In those roles, Charlene was part of launching and helping lead the Coalition to End Money Bond in 2016 and the Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice in 2019. In 2021, their joint statewide legislative campaign culminated in the passage of the Pretrial Fairness Act, which will make Illinois the first state to completely eliminate money bail. All right, we'll hear Charlene talk about that in just a bit. So I don't wanna waste any more time. I am super excited. Let's open it up to our speakers and we're gonna start with Rachel Hersey. Thanks so much, Mohammed. Um, thank you, Critical Resistance, for creating this space for us to share some of our experiences. And thanks to all of you for joining. And extra special thanks to our ASL interpreters this evening as well. As Mohammed mentioned, my name is Rachel Herzing. I am um, based in New York City and Muncie Lenape territory. And um, it is summer and my windows are open, so it is also loud where I am. So I wanna warn you in advance, if you hear stuff going on in the background, that's just life being life, okay? So I'm here to talk about um, the Stop the Injunction Coalition's campaign to eliminate the use of gang injunctions in Oakland, California. The campaign ran roughly between 2010 and 2017. I participated in the coalition as a member of Critical Resistance. The height of the activity in this campaign ended more than 10 years ago, and there were lots and lots and lots of people involved. So I want to acknowledge up front that what I'm sharing tonight will be only a sliver of the story and that I will may misremember things or have memories that are different from other people. And likely I'm going to leave out lots of nuance also to keep within my time. So the main thing is there, I'm sure I'm going to miss something important and um, my apologies in advance for any coalition members who are sad that I missed something specific. So kind of by way of context, I guess I'll start at the basics. What is a gang injunction? It is um, a legal action. There are lots of ins and outs but in very broad strokes, a gang injunction is a civil lawsuit filed against a group of people cops have identified as gang affiliated and that they've also identified as a public nuisance. A gang injunction prohibits the named people from participating in certain activities within a defined geographic area or zone. Barred activities usually include a combination of, of legal and already criminalized actions. And examples might include being outside during court determined curfew hours, loitering, 
appearing in public with anyone cops have labeled a gang member, whether or not they were named on the injunction, possessing drugs, wearing colors that law enforcement associates with the name gang, that kind of stuff. The injunctions also by default increase the level and intensity of policing of everyday people in injunction zones. So they wind up impacting many more people than just the people who are named in them. The city of Oakland imposed the first injunction, a so-called temporary injunction in North Oakland in early 2010 against the so-called North Side Oakland Gang. This is a gang that I have never met anyone associated with and many in the neighborhood said simply doesn't exist. Neighbors began opposing the injunction when they learned about it months after it had begun. A loose coalition of neighbors, families of named people, activists and lawyers came together to challenge it. By the end of 2010, the injunctions had moved to the east, targeting a zone four times the size of the North Oakland zone with triple the number of individual names, as well as naming the Norteños Street Organization. Both injunctions also included dozens of so-called John Doe's, which were placeholders for people that could be named at later date. The North Oakland injunction primarily targeted young black men and the East Oakland injunction primarily targeted young Latino men. With the imposition of the East Oakland injunction, the coalition grew into a citywide coalition dedicated to fighting both injunctions. One other thing that's important to note is that um, these injunctions were implemented during a wave of intense gentrification across the San Francisco Bay Area. That was a big part of the context for the work. So I'm not going to get into every single detail of the history at this point. I'm going to drop a couple of things in the chat if you want to learn more. So this first one here is a link to um, the Stop the Injunctions Coalition blog, which still is up and um, acts as a bit of an archive right now. And then I'm going to drop another one right here in a second that is um, a book chapter that some members of the coalition wrote for an anthology that was looking at um, policing counterinsurgency. Um, and so you can look there for more details about how the campaign ran and the history and all of that. Thank you for the support, Shirley. All right, so initially the goal of the Stop the Injunction Coalition was to roll back the temporary gang injunction in North Oakland. But as the city expanded its injunction ambitions, the coalition also expanded and developed a set of demands that were aimed at eliminating the use of gang injunctions across Oakland challenging the violence of policing more broadly and advocating for life affirming measures to strengthen Oakland neighborhoods. As the citywide coalition came together, we developed this set of demands and they're gonna be hard to see because the document's not great. So I will also read them for you. Um, they were to stop the injunctions and all police violence, community self-determination, which was sometimes also referred to as our Oakland, our solutions, to defend immigrant communities, including no deportations and no collaboration with ICE or Immigration and Customs Enforcement, affordable housing and stable employment, and the accountability from city government and increased decision-making for all Oakland residents. So when CR, when critical resistance got involved in the effort to stop the North Oakland injunction, the campaign didn't have a specific ideological direction that I remember. The focus was really on immediate needs, relief for people named on the injunction, their loved ones and their neighbors. And it also wasn't obvious that prison industrial complex abolitionist lens would even be welcomed by the people involved in the fight. But we felt that we could contribute something useful and we saw it as an opportunity to engage in a campaign to not only prevent a specific set of policing harms, but also to draw attention to the violence of policing more generally while advocating for what neighborhoods really need to be healthy and stable. 
So after some internal discussion, Critical Resistance decided to put a substantial amount of the organization's local focus into the campaign. And we began doing political education with the coalition, people named on the injunction and their families from a prison industrial complex abolitionist perspective. And I will acknowledge that there were times when we may have pushed too hard, but we generally speaking, tried not to be too heavy handed in introducing our politics as we entered the coalition. The goal was not to proselytize or um, convert people to abolition, but was to use those politics to inform the campaign. The coalition never had a completely prison industrial complex abolitionist orientation, and that actually still seems right to me, given the broad range of people and groups involved. But the coalition allowed abolitionist forces, including but not limited to critical resistance, to exercise leadership and did not obstruct abolitionist thinking and action. We also got involved early on in shaping strategy and messaging to help demonstrate that the coalition could avoid taking steps that would build up other aspects of the prison industrial complex or reinforce the legitimacy of policing and avoid communicating in ways that would take a not in my backyard approach or stigmatize other groups. So for instance, at the very beginning of the fight, we heard frequently there are no gangs in North Oakland. There's not a gang problem in North Oakland. Where the real gang problem is, is in West Oakland or in East Oakland. So we were trying to, um, you know, minimize that kind of thing in favor of really talking about who the real enemy was. All right. So um, as the campaign became citywide, um, we, were, we started advancing an affirmative vision that decentered the prison industrial complex in favor of life affirming policies, practices, and institutions. To my mind, that is an abolitionist vision, one that does not center the prison industrial complex as the center of gravity, and that articulates how we can live better without the violence of the punishment system. Additionally, through the process of fighting the gang injunctions, we also successfully prevented the imposition of 11 additional gang injunctions, fought a citywide curfew for young people, challenged a stay away order targeting Occupy Oakland activists, began fighting Urban Shield, the SWAT war games and trade show, and ran the chief of police and city attorney out of town. We wound up beating the injunctions but this campaign didn't completely eliminate policing in Oakland. So we weren't at aiming for kind of a maximalist abolition of policing goal. We were thinking about what is um, a big chunk that we could take out of the set of tools that they have at their disposal, but also that delegitimates policing. I want to talk a tiny bit here about winning because I know that um, part of why we're here is that some people reject the idea of winning. In the case of this campaign, I think winning was important. Um, and I should note, we did not win in some spectacular way. We won um, because we outlasted our opposition. And I can talk more about that in Q&A if people are interested in that. But winning meant the difference between people living under intensive surveillance, police intervention, and criminalization, and people being able to move freely around the town, to associate with whom they like, and to ex exercise a measure of self-determination. So defeating this specific policy was a win. But winning was also making the issue of gang injunctions political poison, which we did. It was engaging people who may not have ever thought about the impacts of policing directly involved in fighting its violence. Winning was turning moms into community organizers. Winning was destabilizing the idea that policing is or should be a natural feature of our day-to-day -day lives. Winning was elevating the power of people and connecting them to organ, of young people rather, and connecting them to organizations with which some of them still work. Winning is having built community power in North and East Oakland. 
This is all winning and every aspect of those wins was important to the coalition. Like most campaigns, the Stop the Injunctions Coalition used a multi-pronged strategy to, in its fight. The coalition will usually, usually would say it had a three-pronged strategy. I'm going to mention six parts tonight. We did grassroots organizing. We knocked doors and we talked to people in the injunction zones. We did community education sessions. We did voter education during election cycles. We facilitated mobilizations and rallies and direct actions. We engaged in policy advocacy. We testified at hearings and meetings. We did this weekly for a while or sometimes more than once a week. We lobbied local legislators within legal limits for the 501c3 police out there. We did legislative education. And while we spent lots of time doing this policy work, it was always tied to organizing and not ever seen as an end in itself. It was an important part of what we did, but it was not the point of what we did. We did lots of media advocacy. We organized the press and other kind of um, independent media outlets. We created our own media, including videos. Uh, we maintained that blog, I told you, that's still available. We issued people's reports. We engaged in spokesperson training of most directly impacted people. And I want to specifically say the name of Isaac Contiveros here because he was essential in demanding that the people who were named on the injunctions and their loved ones be the face of the campaign and be the primary spokespeople. And he got them ready to do that. We engaged in cultural organizing, a lot of cultural organizing actually. And I wanna highlight this image here from Dignidad Rebelde, who was really important in helping us make our campaign beautiful. I also wanna name specifically Eastside Arts Alliance who helped us do that. We made murals, we hosted block parties and barbecues. We hosted film nights. We ran a community garden. We did bike rides through the injunction zones. We, people made music and we integrated indigenous ceremony throughout. We engaged in legal advocacy. Injunctions are legal actions, so they required a legal defense. And we were lucky enough to have a group of people come on as a legal team who offered pro bono assistance to us. Um, and that legal team also was in regular communication with the coalition and we were able to really work together to ensure that the organizing didn't get out ahead of the legal remedies and the legal remedies didn't get out ahead of the organizing. I can talk more about that too later if that's of interest. The last part that I want to mention was service. And it's really important to note that this wasn't service simply for the sake of doing service, but it was highly targeted and well-coordinated direct support to people named on the injunction and their loved ones. And I wanna say the name Tony Marks Block here because he was incredibly influential in coordinating this work. We hosted a hotline for people who wanted to make complaints about incidences of police violence. We did home visits. We did advocacy with people's employers and we did ongoing jail and prison support. So um, by way of wrapping up here, I'll say what was so remarkable about the campaign was that all these strategies were integrated into a fairly well-coordinated and city-wide campaign. When one aspect became too outsized, we adjusted and we realigned. There were also times when each aspect got to shine. I wanna give a special shout out to the young people and the youth workers who supported those young people especially to name Chicano Moratorium Coalition here. They were the lifeblood of the campaign and they kept us fighting. And I also want to acknowledge the brave roles that the, na the named people on the injunction played in the campaign. They were involved in all aspects of the campaign, but as I noted, some number of them were also spokespeople and consistently testified before city council, even as they were being directly targeted by the cops. A number of them lost jobs, suffered harassment and their families suffered harassment as a result of their leadership, but their leadership was invaluable. My understanding is that this was the first successful grassroots challenge to the use of injunctions in the United States. 
I'm incredibly grateful to have been a part of this campaign. And if there's interest when we get into a later part of the conversation, I'd be very happy to share legacies and lessons um, that we learned from the campaign. But I'm gonna stop flapping my gums now. And I'm gonna turn things over to the spectacular Judy Shept. Thanks, Rachel. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Judah. I am coming to you from Kentucky. Really uh, totally honored to be here in conversation with everyone. Uh, as I'm sure is probably true for just about everybody, CR has been a guiding political and intellectual light for me for, um, I mean, I'm going to age myself here, but almost the full 25 years of its existence. And congrats to the organization on that milestone. Um, and so, yeah, it's always just such an honor to be in conversation with you all. Um, and I'm already learning so much, as I always do, from Rachel. So I'm here to talk about, um, at this point, it's actually two campaigns. I'll focus mostly on our winning campaign against United States Penitentiary Lecher in Eastern Kentucky. But as I'll talk about, um, and sort of to the point that Rachel made, um, our victory against that prison in 2019 is a bit fraught and complicated as it's uh, as it has been kind of resurrected in a new form that we are currently kind of building a coalition to fight in this very moment. So I will talk a little bit about this kind of nascent coalition that has formed to refight the prison that we successfully defeated just three years ago. So I'll spend most of the time talking about that campaign work. Um, I do want to um, sketch out some brief regional context in which to situate our fight. Um, my guess is most folks on the call are probably not necessarily from Kentucky or not from Appalachia. And so I want to spend a little bit of time just here at the beginning, building out a little bit of that context. So the prison and jail geography of our region is really dense and expansive. And, and I would actually say still growing. There's 16 prisons in central Appalachia. Half of those, eight of those are in eastern Kentucky alone. That includes, uh, you know, a bunch of state prisons. I think there's three state prisons in Eastern Kentucky. There's two state prisons in Southwestern Virginia, which are, you know, particularly notorious as that states as Virginia's uh, supermax facilities. So those are, of course, state-run prisons. But there's also a particularly dense concentration of federal prisons in Eastern Kentucky. In fact the densest concentration of federal prisons in the United States is in Eastern Kentucky. There are currently four, and the campaigns that I'm here to talk about in a moment um, were and are against what would be the fifth federal prison in Eastern Kentucky if it were to be built. So there's state prisons, there's federal prisons, and of course, as everywhere, as is true everywhere, there's a bunch of jails. In Eastern Kentucky, all of them are at or over capacity. Most of them, I think, are somewhere between 140% and 200 plus percent capacity. Those jails are growing in part because there's growing numbers of people from rural Eastern Kentucky communities going into those jails, but also because of agreements that those jails have with the Kentucky Department of Corrections, but also with ICE and the U.S. Marshals to hold state prisoners or federal detainees at those county jails for per diem payments. All of this expansion at all these different scales is happening in Kentucky for a couple reasons. So first, the state of Kentucky itself has just like a particularly high rate of incarceration. It's something like 40% higher than the national average since 2000. Okay, so it's one of the sort of fastest growing individual carceral states in the United States. But the other reason um, that I think is particularly consequential to mention, just in general, and also because of the campaign, is the decline, the real like rapid precipitous decline of the coal industry in a place like Eastern Kentucky. And that's occurred on a couple of fronts. 
there's been a rapid precipitous decline of cold jobs. And in fact, cold jobs are at their lowest total in Kentucky since the 1890s. At the same time, probably um, not a surprise to anybody, correctional officer jobs have increased to the point that there are almost double the number of correctional officer jobs in Kentucky as there are mining jobs. But in addition of consequence to understanding this like expansive carceral geography, um, there's also been a real precipitous notable decline in revenue to rural coal field communities. And so the prisons have become not just like proposed as like a rural jobs program, but also as a way for communities to perform like basic municipal infrastructure stuff, like updating wastewater treatment plants and extending water lines to remote parts of counties, um, building or paving roads. And then also more, um, you know, more sort of uh, social infrastructure, like keeping school enrollments up, keeping rural hospitals open. And I'm talking about in very concrete ways, the prisons are talked about and written into like grant proposals for these kinds of things, okay? In short, they are really serving as sort of solutions in quotes of course for these very real crises of racial capitalism so that's sort of where i'll leave it in terms of some context of course happy to revisit any and all of that in our discussion um as folks can probably guess most of those prisons most of those 16 prisons in central appalachia not all of them but most were built in the last four decades or so the proposal for United States Penitentiary Letcher, which would have been a 1400 bed maximum security prison in Letcher County in the southeastern part of Kentucky. That proposal occurred early, like in 2005, 2006. Um, it really gained momentum in the 2010s, particularly so the sort of uh, most intensive part of its lifespan was between about 2015 and 2019. United States Congress allocated almost half a billion dollars for its construction, 444 million to be specific, which were it to have been built, that would have made it the most expensive federal prison ever in the United States. As that process began to accelerate in about 2015 with that allocation, it was met with this kind of considerable, if not quite kind of coherent opposition that I was a part of and lots of folks were a part of in the form of a, you know, I'm still not like entirely sure what to call this formation. I mean, it kind of felt like a, a loosely formed coalition. It was certainly a campaign that like it stretched across, you know, space and scale um, and sites. It had deep roots in Letcher County, but also had lots of other folks involved from around Kentucky and from around the country, including people incarcerated in prisons. That coalition included challenges in terms of like the coalition's approach to stopping the prison. It included challenges to the official environmental review process that the Bureau of Prisons had to engage in legally to build a prison. It included local property owners who and other residents who like refused to sell their land to the Bureau of Prisons. And it included local organizers on the ground in Letcher County, many of them young and somewhat recently politicized through a few things that I think are really important to name. They were politicized through a radio show that's a long standing feature of this stalwart media arts organization in Letcher County called Apple Shop, Apple as in Appalachia, which does a lot of things, one of which is broadcast a show into, I think, eight of the regional prisons that are in its listening range 
that plays messages like um, messages of support from loved ones on the outside to their incarcerated loved ones on the inside. And many of the young people who would become organizers against USP Letcher were DJs for that show and had this very kind of intimate relationship with um, people who were incarcerated in the region and their loved ones on the outside who would call in. So they were politicized by that experience and also by sort of the first wave of Black Lives Matter protests. Again, we're talking about 2014, 15, 16. And those folks on the ground in Letcher County, who I'll talk about more extensively in a minute, were engaged in really trying to kind of interrupt and offset the sort of common sense around the economic impact of the prison. So I wanna be sure to say a little bit about each of these actors and the way that their work kind of contributed to the eventual defeat of USP Letcher. So the first folks I mentioned were national environmental activists and attorneys around the country who had been following the sort of development of USP Letcher. And when it was, when that allocation of 444 million uh, arrived, really jumped into, jumped into their work. These are folks from groups like uh, the Prison Ecology Project and Fight Toxic Prisons and the Abolitionist Law Center. A lot of these folks had extensive experience using the, so the NEPA process, the NEPA process is the National Environmental Policy Act process that is federal environmental law that requires a big federal infrastructure project like a prison to go through this kind of process. And these folks were, um, have been through sort of challenging other kinds of projects like extraction projects and infrastructure projects on environmental grounds through the NEPA process. And they kind of took that strategy forged in environmental justice campaigns and mapped it onto this fight against USP Letcher. So they focused on targeting the environmental, the potential environmental impact of the prison in Letcher County, challenging or calling attention to the possibility of the prison disturbing a variety of habitats, its threat to water, uh, its proximity to old growth forest, possibilities of light pollution, um, and various like public health concerns. Crucially, those challenges in the pages of the environmental impact statement, this like vast statement that the Bureau of Prisons had to put out, those challenges forced the Bureau of Prisons to have to go back and revise and resubmit the environmental impact statement multiple times. I'd have to go back and double check. All told, it was either four or five times. And in between each iteration, we had six months something like that, in which to sort of, uh, in which, um, you know, we were sort of bought more time to organize and work to kind of shift the analysis and also to, to kind of just delay for the, like, kind of for the larger political context to shift, which ultimately it did, and which ultimately wound up destabilizing the foundation of support for the prison, which I'll talk about in just a sec. So that's the kind of national environmental approach. As I was saying before, on the ground in Letcher County, a group of mostly young folks started a group that they called the Letcher Governance Project, which really understood opposition to the prison as part of like a larger claim for grassroots democracy and planning, and as an intervention into like the long history of corporate control in the coal fields. And you know, they did a whole bunch, in particular, one, one um, development that they engaged in, which I think is like particularly notable, was particularly impactful, was they, they developed this uh, framework and hashtag called R444 million, again, the original price tag of the prison, in order to disavow the prison and simultaneously demand meaningful community controlled development and planning in Letcher County. And that framing really opened up this important space for like non-carceral 
development um, and planning ideas to sort of flourish. People floated these ideas using that hashtag on social media, in the pages of the EIS during this like open comment period. Um, and between those interventions in the EIS and the work of the national environmental activists and lawyers I mentioned, it wound up creating like a, a substantial like counter narrative and counter archive to what the state sort of always tends to argue about having overwhelming local support for a prison or about the role of outside agitators, right? We now have this archive of hundreds of comments against the prison through various iterations of the EIS from local people, from people outside the county and people locally and outside made what I think is the correct argument that with any of these kinds of facilities and maybe particularly so with a federal prison, there's no real outsiders, right? This affects everybody. The last actor I wanna be sure to mention and I'll be begin to move towards wrapping up here um, was a local resident who's a landowner and whose land was part of the original uh, rendering of the prison site by the Bureau of Prisons. His name was Mitch Whitaker. He's a fourth generation resident of Letcher County. Um, and his land the you know, like I said, the BOP wanted to purchase and had drawn into the original mapping of the site. And he, from the beginning, from day one, was totally opposed to it, fought them, refused to sell to them, and joined, but, but didn't do so on his own, right? He talks a lot. He talked a lot then and, and to this day about how important it was to find all of these other players to, I think he says in his words, to kind of attach his boat to right, to form kind of like a broader uh, opposition. He understood his fight against the prison. It wasn't really, you know, it'd be like easy to frame it on kind of like NIMBY grounds. And it really wasn't. It was, you know, to, to hear him talk about it, um, he understood it as kind of part of a legacy in his family, where his grandfather, who had his land before him, had fought coal companies when coal companies tried to take the land under this nefarious legal mechanism called the broad form deed. So Mitch really understood his opposition to the BOP as part of this legacy. So like I said, all together in this somewhat cohesive, but somewhat like ragtag coalition, we wound up delaying the project by many years, four or five years. Um, a lot changed during that time that I'm, I, I think is important to name. Trump's election happened during this period. And with it, you know, he had on the one hand this focus on the First Step Act, but also this obsessive and racist focus on the border. And it meant that the federal prison was less of a priority for him, for his administration. We had the Bureau of Prisons actually openly admit, because we forced them to, that they didn't actually need the prison because of decline, you know, by their own calculus need it, because of a decrease in the federal prison population. They were also forced to admit because of people writing in during the EIS process that the prison wouldn't bring the kind of economic development that they had originally proposed or promised. So a lot shifted and the project lost some credibility because of it. Having said that, and despite the Bureau of Prisons acknowledging they didn't need it, the project still moved forward. It passed through the EIS process. The Bureau of Prisons released what's called a record of decision in 2018, in the, fall, in the spring of 2018, saying it was basically moving into the construction phase. And yet, one of the um, kind of crucial components of the work of national attorneys was that um, they had been kind of anticipating this maneuver and had been planning for it. And by participating in the EIS process had been, had been kind of fulfilling, I think what amounts to sort of an exhaustion requirement for a lawsuit. They were also um, during the EIS process, working with people in federal prison, asking them to become plaintiffs in what they imagined would be an eventual lawsuit. And so once the record of decision was released in the spring of 2018, the attorneys working with our coalition filed a lawsuit it included, the plaintiffs included people in federal prison. It included Mitch Whitaker, and it wound up including a new environmental organization based in Letcher County, comprised of a number of us, 
that served as more of like a traditional plaintiff in a NEPA lawsuit against the federal government. And the Bureau of Prisons ultimately uh, blinked. They knew that they couldn't win. And close to a year after they passed the record of decision, they pulled it. And the prison was, was essentially defeated, right? It was like a pretty historic defeat. As far as I know, um, no prison has ever gotten to that pretty much like construction phase where an ROD has been passed and uh, was ultimately not was ultimately not built. So it felt like a major victory. Um, I know I'm sort of at my time here. I want to just spend a minute or two um, detailing kind of what's happened since then. So that was 2019. Since then, a lot has happened. We defeated the prison, as I just said. But with that, of course, it meant that Letcher County did not receive an investment of half a billion dollars. And it was a good sort of reminder, I think, for all of us that it's important to sort of think about these and celebrate them as victories and situate those victories in what really is a protracted and dialectical process whereby those victories might raise new kinds of tensions and contradictions and fights. On that note, we defeated this federal prison, but in the last few years since that defeat, state prison capacity has actually dramatically expanded in Eastern Kentucky, like a new prison opened, a thousand beds was added to this other prison, jails continue to expand. And as I mentioned in the intro, the feds, the Bureau of Prisons just in this past September, two months after devastating floods uh, hit Eastern Kentucky, the Bureau of Prisons has re-proposed a prison for Letcher County. Now as a medium security prison that they're calling Federal Correctional Institution Letcher, but it's more or less the same proposal. So we are now in this new-ish stage of reforming a coalition. It feels, as somebody who's who's been a part of both, it feels different to me. It feels more intentional, uh, more grounded. Um, we're thinking a lot together about how we move together across various differences, how we think about conflict, how we think about strategy. The composition is really vast and dense. A lot of people in Eastern Kentucky, a lawyers from a couple of different movement law organizations, a lot of us elsewhere in Kentucky affiliated with different kinds of organizations. Um, other organizations from outside the state. We have a working group structure in place. So it's definitely a fight that is coming um, for people who are thinking about ways to you know, get involved in these kinds of things. Uh, the new environmental impact study hasn't been released yet. It probably will in the next couple months. And so we're gearing up for what no doubt will be uh, another one of these kinds of fights. But I'm feeling a lot more... Um, I mean, frankly, I'm feeling a lot more hopeful about this one, even as we were successful in the last time around, just because of the sort of movement infrastructure that I think we have in place. Uh, I'm gonna end there, lots more to say, of course, but I'm looking forward to having more of a discussion with everybody. And so I'm gonna kick it over to Charlene. And again, just gonna say grateful to everybody for being here, to the interpreters, thank you so much, to Rachel, to Mohammed, to everybody, thanks. Hi everyone. I again, my name is Charlene Grace. She, her, hers. I'm so excited to follow Rachel and Judah, and I want to try to um, emphasize the things we did without repeating too much. Because of course, across different campaigns, there are a lot of similar strategies. Um, so I am talking about the campaign to win pretrial freedom or pretrial fairness in Illinois. Of course, I'm here as the panelist, but there are um, dozens of court organizers and thousands of people who have participated in this campaign. Um, I really want to name the Coalition to End Money Bonds and the Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice. And also, I'm a, I'm a, oh, is my sound bad? Uh-oh. I will try to keep, keep me updated if, um, if I go out again. Um, okay. Um, so I just, another thing is I really love resources. I like to read a lot about the work that other people are doing. It's inspiring. 
in our campaign, we borrowed and imitated and loved on strategies from other places a lot. So I'm going to hopefully drop a bunch of links that I hope will be useful to you, even if you're not working on campaigns around jails or pretrial freedom, that some will, will be useful for you. So I just shared the link to the Coalition and Money Bond and the Illinois Network for Pretrial Justice, which are the coalitions that built this campaign and um, this win. And so the campaign that I'm talking about began in 2016 and in 2021, in January of 2021, uh, resulted in the Illinois legislature passing the Free Trial Fairness Act, which completely eliminates money bail and requires the release um, immediately after arrest of the vast majority of people who are arrested every year. Um, but that law was supposed to go into effect of January of this year. I just want to give the context that we're, that we're in and that I'm talking to you from. It was supposed to be in effect as of January of this year, but because of lawsuits challenging the law from right-wing forces, from law enforcement, and from opponents um, who want to continue to use unaffordable money bail to jail people without any oversight or review or standards of any kind, um, we are, the law is not in effect yet, and we are waiting on a decision from our state Supreme Court about whether it will go into effect, when it will go into effect. And we do believe it will go into effect, that the law will be found constitutional, but it's not in effect right now in terms of the main portions of it, the, the parts that eliminate money bail, et cetera. That said, we did a lot of other things in the law at the same time, including trying to head off some of the worst things about um, the pretrial electronic monitoring system that locks people in their homes for and, and does still um, try to lock people in their homes for 24 hours. So there are parts of the law that are in effect, like parts of the law that require anyone on electronic monitoring and house arrest to have periods of time where they can leave their home. Because before the reforms in our bill, people did not have permission to leave their home and do their laundry or buy groceries. Um, and we have, I'll share an article too, um, about the sort of high tech incarceration limits that we did, which are really about limiting the use of risk assessment tools or the role of risk assessment tools and electronic monitoring. And I know James Kilgore is here. So if you have not been following his and media justice's work around limiting and ultimately eliminating electronic monitoring, then please check it out because it is um, really helpful and we've learned a lot from James and Emmett and media justice over the years. So one thing that happened early on is we did start out, I think, even though some of us identified as abolitionists, we were holding on to this rally to end money bail. But we were lucky to be in conversation with folks nationally who were like, is that the demand? Couldn't it be worse for people? Some people pay their money bail and get out. And so that really helped us refocus and talk about what we wanted to win, which was pretrial freedom. And um, along with that, and trying to think ahead to the ways that the, sh the system, when being limited in its power in one area, like the power to impose money bail, might shift to a different area, like imposing electronic monitoring and house arrest, those are, some of the ways we tried to head that off. Um, in terms of how the campaign developed a vision, when we launched in 2016, we had explicitly abolitionist organizations like Chicago Community Bond Fund, which is how I came into this work, and our partners at Southsiders Organized for Unity and Liberation, or SOUL, and we had very inside game policy organizations with offices downtown that very much were not um, in the same place. But we created principles specifically about the pretrial work that we were going to do together that everyone felt good about, that were not uh, overly ambiguous. And I think the more important thing about working together across um, abolitionists and non-abolitionists, more, more reform-minded groups, or reformist reform-minded groups, is that we did, we had a lot of time. Um, and we built trust. And I think there was a real feeling of accountability because um, a thing that I see and that I think our opponents take advantage of 
is when we rush into coalition and we don't have trust and we don't have mutual accountability. And that I think that's part of the reason why people get scared. Abolitionists particularly get scared working with non-abolitionists because there's this feeling that they can be pulled off. Um, and I think that is as much about the relationships we build and whether we move at a speed of trust and we take the time that's necessary together um, as it is anyone's actual sort of bottom line orientation. Um, because there is a lot of common ground, particularly when systems are so big and so violent. There's a lot of power that we can take away from the system before we're getting to abolition, right? Before before we as reformers and abolitionists are actually split, right? I think about what Rachel said with their campaign didn't eliminate policing in Oakland, right? They didn't, there wasn't a point where they that they won where they were in conflict with the abolitionists and the reformists who still wanted police but they were able to bring people who wanted to limit police power along. So I think some of the really obvious things probably to all of you who are at a critical resistance webinar is really keeping the goal of getting more people free at the center of this. Um, and I think there is, there's a lot of tension, right? Um, we are, when we ultimately passed a piece of legislation. So we were drafting new parts of the criminal statute, revising parts of the criminal code that fundamentally are about when police have to release people. And sometimes there, there are exceptions to that, right? And there, when prosecutors can charge people with a new crime for a violation of their pretrial conditions and limiting that power, but doing all of that in a context where police are arresting people in the context of the laws that are about how police arrest people and how the courts make decisions about how to jail people. So as abolitionists, we think, well, we don't want the courts to have power to jail people. We don't want the police to have the power to arrest people. And that is obviously true. Um, and I think figuring out how to engage with those criminal laws where you can get as much, you can take away as much power as possible, um, and steer clear of the uh, sort of giveaways to our opponents or the other side that sometimes we think are necessary, but aren't necessary, or they would be necessary. But if we build enough power, then we don't have to give those things up anymore. And I would say that's something that we learned and that I think has been a big source of humility for me because I, I am an organizer and I do organizing, but I'm also a policy advocate and sometimes a lobbyist. And that means that, um, oh, I lost my, I lost my train of thought, but, oh, that's what I want to say. So a lot of times there's pressure to negotiate with ourselves before we meet the other people that we're negotiating with who want something else or want the opposite of what we want um, to look reasonable. And I think by and large, our opponents don't do that as much as we do on the left. Um, so we need to practice being brave in our ask. We need to um, be ready to take advantage of openings that come. So one thing that happened for our bill is we have been working on this campaign since 2016. We thought we were gonna pass this bill in 2020. And then COVID happened, the legislature shut down, then the uprisings happened. And the entire political context in which we were advocating for more pretrial freedom shifted. And ultimately when our bill passed in January of 2021, it was so much more complete and so much more liberatory than I think we actually expected when we started that process. And the reason was because millions of people took to the street. The reason was because people engaged in property destruction in our state and other states across the whole country. Um, the reason was that the political context changed in ways that were totally unpredictable and completely outside our control. And if we had cut away more of our bill before then, just because we didn't think we could win it, it wouldn't have been there when it came time after the uprising um, to, to vote on the bill. So that's that's a, a was a big lesson for me, right? There's a certain arrogance in thinking we know um 
what's coming and how much we'll be able to win. So we want to win as much as we can. We don't want to um, not win anything at all that could benefit people, could get people free, could keep people from being jailed um, or arrested or prosecuted. But um, we're all, we'll, we want to, I think, be open, be open to the fact that the context might change. And we should figure out what we can do and what's within our power to change that context. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the specific things we did. Um, one thing we did was we, as others have said, I think we've used critical resistances resources for a long, long time. Um, we've been in partnership and conversation. And I just dropped in the chat um, a document that Critical Resistance and Community Justice Exchange, which houses the National Bail Fund Network, created a couple years ago that's about pretrial reforms and trying to bring an abolitionist change analysis to different pretrial reforms. So being in community with people to talk through hard things um, and talk through nuances and talk through specific policies even was a huge part of um, helping us refine what we thought we could do and avoid pitfalls, like avoid things that were coming from sort of the loudest voices in certain reform spaces, but they weren't politically aligned voices. So just being finding a way to be in community and get feedback from people was huge. Um, another thing that was important and that we've been doing increasingly over the last several years where we've been, since the law passed in January 2021, we have been defending against attempts to repeal the law or roll it back um, for the last two and a half years. And one thing that we have been doing in that time is really taking ownership over the public safety arguments, right? So the critiques are very often they're like, oh, you can't have pretrial reform, you can't end money bail because it'll hurt safety. So we're like, absolutely, you want to talk about safety? Let's talk about how we make community safety because not only is it intuitive and a sort of rooted um, value that putting people in jail and taking them away from their community and taking them away from their support system, interrupting their employment if they were employed, um, putting them on a pathway where we know they're less likely to have stable housing, all those destabilizing things, those don't create community safety, right? Because people, the, the opponents, and sometimes the media that goes along with them, they're thinking about public safety or community safety is just whatever the cops want. And we're like, let's talk about community safety as keeping people in their neighborhoods, not taking millions of dollars from overwhelmingly black, brown, and poor communities, and specifically black, brown, and poor women who are paying the majority of these bonds for their loved ones. Let's talk about how keeping more money and more resources in those communities actually makes us safer. We, we will talk, we will have the public safety arguments, the community safety arguments all the time, because not just values wise, but actually also the research shows that we are right, right? Um, jails can disappear people for a little while, but people are overwhelmingly coming back. And when we have conversations with people who are concerned, um, genuinely concerned, right? Not trolling concerned, but genuinely concerned, um, they really, they they get it. I think it makes sense, right? When we say, look, this person who goes to jail for two weeks or two months, they're coming back and the, to our neighborhoods. And the question is, are they coming back to our neighborhoods in a position where we have helped made it more likely that they're going to have access to the things they need to thrive? Or have we actually taken away the things, anything they had before that was helping them thrive and put them in a much worse position. So really owning the public safety arguments, the community safety arguments has been something we've done. Um, thinking about campaigns in the larger context of movements, not just like him we're winning, but this is something also um, that I learned from James Kilgore, which is that our campaigns have to build movements. Um, so one of the things we want to be thinking about as we're organizing is, is the movement stronger when the campaign is over? Are people more skilled? Are we better able to work together than we were before, right? And I think that can also help with thinking about priorities because it can um, create some, some pushback on our own internal um, senses of urgency or things that 
can lead to burnout and lead to less sustainable practices or lead to breaches of trust internally that are the kinds of reasons why people leave organizing. Um, I want to talk real quickly. I'm also a little over time, but um, I think we're doing okay. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about the really specific strategies we use. Um, we did start out the campaign working with civil rights attorneys to bring litigation, challenging the legality, the constitutionality of jailing people only because they don't have enough money to pay a money bond. Um, and that was great leverage. It was great political pressure. I think we actually benefited immensely from the fact that that lawsuit ultimately got thrown out a year and a half or so after it was filed. It was thrown out on procedural grounds, so it never was resolved in the courts. And I think actually that that helped us because there are so many limits to what we could have gotten if the court and a judge were involved in figuring out what replaced our terrible money-based system. But instead, the lawsuit while it was pending it gave us a lot of access to media coverage to reshape the narrative. It gave um, leverage and political pressure to our campaign. And ultimately, the number of people in Cook County Jail, which includes Chicago, it decreased by 1,500 people on any given day as a result of changes, sort of personnel changes, internal policy changes that the court made that directly flowed from our lawsuit and didn't rely on any changes in the law. So I think that was also an early lesson we had, which was um, just the, the power of, of that organizing um, that we, when the courts really feel pressure, they can make changes without changing anything about the law that will get a lot more people free. Um, we did a lot of organizing. We had a lot of base building groups and sort of traditional community organizing groups who were involved, who were doing town halls, who were canvassing door to door. Um, we organized multiple lobby days, bringing busloads of, of people and matching t-shirts down to the um, state capitol. So there was a question, I think, about the least sexy work of the campaign. And I can think of a lot of really unsexy work that was stuffing 400 folders, um, sorting shirts into <laughs> sizes, and then sorting those sizes into who was on which bus, um, you know, looking at a big database of people who registered for an event and figuring out which legislators were there that they could meet with or talk to. So there's so much unsexy work to do in the background um, and, and often very satisfying. And I think um, uh, it's, it's the majority of the work in these campaigns. So um, of course there were direct actions and protests. There was so much research. Um, our coalition has written so many reports and done, um, I think at this point, three different court watching campaigns of different kinds and different goals. Um, and part of that's because the courts won't give us data on what they're doing to our people and we can go in and count ourselves and then say, okay, um, this is what's happening. This is what needs to change about it. Um, let me see, a lot of media and narrative work, as other people have said, so whether it's writing op-eds or working with traditional media, a lot of, because the media is so, because traditional media is so, um, in many ways, defaults to presenting police and law enforcement talking points, um, we did a lot of creating our own media on social media, and also create doing art that we could use at direct action. So I want to share um, an article from one of Ch from Chicago's like movement photographer, Sarah G. She's here. Um, and she took some beautiful photos of some art that we made for a rally back in 2018. Um, and just recently, the end of last year and this year, we did a collaboration with Just Seeds Artists Collective. So uh, there's a link in the chat to the Just Seeds portfolio and a series of articles about artists supporting pretrial freedom in Illinois. Um, and then we had, we had, uh, I, I heard Rachel, you talk about uh, lobbying and legislative advocacy within the confines of the C3 regulations. And I would say also something that was new for me in this campaign, but was super important was having C4 partners. So partners who do electoral work specifically, partners who are 
getting candidates for office who are going to be policy makers or decision makers and also have big platforms because of how media flocks to power. So getting them to commit to supporting not just ending money bail, but our proposals specifically. Um, and then also while those C4 organizations were like canvassing door to door for their candidates, they were also having conversations about pretrial justice, about pretrial freedom, those community safety conversations that I talked about earlier. So really saying, let's talk about how we create safety because it's not about just continuing to jail people um, any way we want. Um, and I think that I'll just say one more quick thing on the policy side for people who are built are developing campaigns and are going to be figuring out what you're asking for in terms of a policy wise policy wise is that um i think i think we as abolitionists part of what it means um is that we don't trust the system to do right by the people that it's targeting we don't trust the prison industrial complex to have a bunch of discretionary power judges cops prosecutors and use that for good and so I think what that means is that as much as possible, we should be creating bright line rules and limiting just, it's very simple, I think, um, but it doesn't necessarily happen that much, at least from what I've seen in traditional lobbying or legislative advocacy or policy advocacy, like just creating bright lines and just creating limits on power because we don't want discretion um, that goes up in terms of harshness. And we don't want procedural reforms that we've seen in the courts here all it means is that a judge gets a new script and they they do exactly the same thing. They put the same people in jail as before, but they read a script um, before they do it, right? So that it that that's the procedural reform if there's not a hard cap on their power. Um, and I will wrap up and look forward to the conversation with Rachel and Judah. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I was seriously taking notes during each of your presentations. Um, and as always, learned so much um, when I listen to you all speak. Um, and it's just such an honor to hear about how we actually win and and um, have you all share that with us. So I'm really excited now to just dig into some conversation. Um, I have some questions. I also um, uh, wanna allow you all to open it up and ask questions of each other. Um, but maybe to start, um, each of you talked about you know, this was a this was a through line across each of your uh, presentations and across the the campaigns that you spoke to. Um, but <clears throat> one aspect was really around coalition building in ways that um, you know, as as you all are abolitionists and have been doing abolitionist organizing for a long time and are committed to those politics. Um, and practices. Um, but in your campaigns, you engaged in broad-based coalition building um, that did not seek to, as Rachel put it, you know, proselytize or convert people into abolitionists. And um, Charlene, you mentioned, you know, working with people that weren't abolitionists to, to find um, common ground, right? Um, and I, I want to ask this question, particularly in kind of our moment where abolition has become much more popular um, in the last couple of years, more and more people are subscribing to a, an abolitionist politics. Um, you know, what, what were the kinds of um, like outreach strategies that you use to bring in and, and bring people in where you were wanting to you know, bring an abolitionist politics to inform the campaign, um, but you were trying to bring people in that, that weren't abolitionists. So maybe I'll start with Rachel. 
and then we'll kick it off there. Cool. Thanks for the question, Mohammed. Um, it's an interesting question because I can't remember trying to bring people into the campaign directly through abolitionist means. I think most of the conversation that I remember having with people on doors or in kind of public events and stuff was one, did you know this thing exists? Because the city was really sneaky about implementing it without any kind of public input, especially the first time around. Um, and if, if they did know, then I wanted to talk to them about if they understood the implications of it. And if they did understand the implications, I wanted to talk to them about what they needed in relationship to that. Um, for people who did not know that the injunctions were in place, then we had a lot of um, opportunity to do education, not only about this specific um, legal action, but also about policing. So we talked to them about um, their experiences of policing in Oakland. We talked to them about what, what helped them feel safe and secure in their neighborhoods if there were things like that. We had kind of more general conversations in which we could um, contextualize this specific legal action and why we were trying to fight it. So I'm not exactly sure um, if that answers your question. I guess what I will say about the how of it is that I think that was probably different organization to organization um, based on what the political orientation was, right? So we um, at Critical Resistance, you know, the goal there, and again, I think some of us did this better and worse and differently over time and all of that. So I don't want to act like it was a slam dunk every time. But, um, you know, I think we had the conversation about um, what we could do besides relying on policing. I think there were other people who had conversations about strategies for keeping young people safe. I think there were other people who had conversations with people about like the public health impacts of policing in Oakland, right? So everybody kind of got to it eventually, but each group started in a slightly different place. What we could agree after lots of conversation internally and lots of political education is that none of us would suggest that any policing of any sort was good for Oakland, right? So it wasn't like, you know, these injunctions are bad, but, you know, if we could just get cops in the right neighborhoods or something like that, right? We ultimately did agree as a coalition, and this took time to come to, that, um, you know, that's why the demand is stop the injunctions and all police violence, right? Like we had to come to that over time, but that ultimately was the demand of the coalition. And the coalition adhered to that. The coalition did not say, um, you know, we want this policing instead of that policing, or we want policing in this neighborhood instead of that neighborhood, or we want to take, you know, just this portion of you know, what they're using on injunctions away and keep the rest in place. And ultimately that's probably how we were able to have some of those conversations on the doors too. And, you know, I don't remember leading with that. I don't remember trying to hide that either, but I don't remember leading with that mostly because we were really interested in doing education about the injunctions. So everybody in the city knew that these things were happening and how to get involved in fighting them. Yeah, thanks so much, Rachel. Um, I, I want to also add in um, uh, something that, that you raised that I think relates to this question um, for others to also chime in, which is avoiding the kind of maximalism, right? It's like, um, you know, as abolitionists, we want to completely eliminate the prison industrial complex, right? But through these campaigns, knowing that we're not gonna you know do that in one fell swoop um and actually uh being strategic in how we're framing our demands and and that being a uh reciprocal 
uh, process where we're meeting with people to inform the demands and, and our coalition partners um, to bring them into the campaigns. So I'm also, you know, interested in uh, what other folks have to say about in kind of uh, doing that coalition building and creating demands and, and deciding on kind of what to target, what kind of like policies or, or things that we want to see, um, how it was a, a step to abolition, you know, or an abolitionist step um, that wasn't maximalist, that brought people along, but still got us uh, along the path that, that we want to go. Yeah, I, I'll jump in. I'm hoping, um, Jude and Rachel, you'll come back and also talk about the maximalist demands, because I was still figuring out my answer to how we brought people along and had conversations about, if not abolition explicitly, abolitionist values. And one thing I was reminded of is that um, we really brought a lot of people in who started out from a place of charity. Um, and I don't mean like mutual aid projects. Necessarily. I really mean like sort of white liberal or liberal charity. And partially that's because I was um, helping run a bail fund. But we really used inquiries that came to us about starting bail funds as the the initial connections that we made statewide to build our statewide coalition. So when we started out in 2016, and then for a couple of years after that, we were really just focused on Cook County, which is where Chicago is. And we were centered in that urban area and Chicago Community Bond Fund only paid bond at Cook County Jail. And um, obviously there's so much organizing going on in 2014, 2015, 2016. Um, and people would reach out to us and be like, we want to start a bail fund in our county. And I will say like bail funds, operating bail fund, being involved in that mutual aid, that direct support for people, getting people out immediately, so important. And it's also what drove me to campaign work, right? Because it's at one point we were raising and spending millions of dollars and we would get a hundred people out of Cook County Jail in a year. And there would be 50,000 people booked into Cook County Jail that year. And like, if that, that's just not an, it's like, like an, it's success for those hundred people. It's success for their loved ones. And it's so inadequate. And I think, um, and also people who donate to bail funds or any kind of thing, a commissary fund, a book program, sometimes they make up things in their mind, right? We'd have donors and they'd be like, well, you all only pay for nonviolent cases. And we're like, we've never, we've never said that. We explicitly say the opposite. Let's talk about that. Let's have a conversation about why we wouldn't let um, the charges that the police and the prosecutors give someone determine who who we help um, and who deserves to be free. <laughs> um, but really, so people would reach out to us from other places in the state and say, we want to start a bail fund. And we'd be like, how about, do you want to end money bail? And that was really um, sort of trying to move from whether it was mutual aid or really thinking from a charity perspective, um, trying to move people into campaign work um, and think about building power so that we didn't need to operate bail funds in Illinois. And I will let, I'll turn it back to you all. I'll say just a couple of real quick things. I think in the context of a rural prison campaign, you know, people join those kinds of fights for lots of different reasons. Um, some of us joined as abolitionists and as people who have been involved in anti-PIC fights. A lot of people join because of some of the factors that I mentioned earlier, you know, like environmental concerns and analysis. And I'm talking about people like in the community where the prison is being proposed. An analysis of like, you know, a long historical analysis of the ways that that community has been targeted by all kinds of exterior outside forces for extraction and expropriation and exploitation from in, in Eastern Kentucky from logging to mining to you know uh waste disposal and waste management industries to Purdue Pharma to the PIC right so people join for all kinds of reasons in my experience limited experience but not just in this campaign actually doing the like campaign work pushes people's like political analysis further, all of us, right? Like my own understanding of all this stuff, of course, shifts in the context of the campaign. I feel like, you know, I'm not from Eastern Kentucky. I'm not from Kentucky. I'm actually from 
a very uh, like one of the densest zip codes, I think, in the United States. So being a part of the campaign, spending lots of time in eastern Kentucky, I think, um, shifted my own understanding. And I think for people in eastern Kentucky, some of whom may not have been abolitionists and may not still be abolitionists, I, I get the sense from them that being a part of the campaign moved at least several of them from being like, well, we don't want a prison here for X, Y, and Z reasons from, that moved them from there to, well, we don't want a prison anywhere, right? Like this isn't good for anybody. Um, which to me is, that's a win, right? Like it's not, it's not, we don't, we're not necessarily asking for everybody to like exit a campaign ready to abolish the PIC, although obviously like, that's a huge win. But if you go into the campaign here and you end over here with your, you know, analysis of whatever um, furthered and deepened and your commitment to the struggle that much more deepened, I think that's a big win. Um, the other thing I would say on a slightly more sober note in response to the second part of your question, Mohammed, is I hope this isn't too far astray from, from what you intended, but part of what I'm thinking about is like, um, and, and really prompted by what's happened since our defeat of USP Letcher, and just to reiterate, right, like a bunch of different kind of expansion happened in Eastern Kentucky since 2019. Um, how do we think about our campaigns as abolitionists, right? Like to me, the, uh, defeating a prison or a jail or something like that is clearly like an abolitionist reform. Um, one of those kind of like concrete abolitionist victories. But if that prison is defeated, but let's say capacity is added to a different prison, right? So the 1,500 people that would have been held in that prison are not held in that prison but it's just added to three different prisons, right? Or the carceral state expands in some other, at some other scale or in some other place. You know, to me, that's like one of those, um, it's not really the question of, of like maximalized abolition, but it is to me a question of like uh, furthering our, I guess like our principled study of the carceral state, how we think about and theorize what abolition means and looks like. Like, yes, we absolutely have to target jail and prison and cop and whatever expansion campaigns. And how do we do so in ways that try to, um, how do we do so in a way that like preempts its other iterations in other places? Mohammed, I have a question um, for Judah and I have a question for Charlene. Can I ask those? Fantastic. Um, Jude, I'm going to start with you and thinking a bit about what you were just um, raising. And, you know, I'm one of those people who's been like all over the place being like, that was a, such a huge victory. And I think it's a victory, period. End of story. I think it is a big deal to um, prevent a federal prison from being built, right? I take your point that, you know, we should always be thinking about all aspects of the prison industrial complex. We don't want to in inadvertently increase um, other parts of the punishment system, even as we win our specific things. I take that point. I'm also interested though in, um, you know, your optimism about this round of fighting. I'm really encouraged by that because when you and I first talked about this new prison, you're like, oh no, right? So I'm really, really excited about that. And I just wonder if you would be willing to share some of the lessons or some of the shifts and conditions that are making you feel more optimistic this time around. And then Charlene, I'm just gonna pose this question to you too, so I don't have to jump back in which is I was interested in this concept you raised about giveaways, right? Which I think is kind of similar in terms of like, what are we building that we just got to tear down, right? Or what are we conceding that we don't need to concede up front? Um, and I was really interested in learning more about the specific kinds of giveaways that you all were navigating um, in the campaign. I love Rachel questions. You are like one of the best question askers out there. I love it. Um, so just to reiterate, right? Like we defeated the prison in 2019. It's been reproposed as Federal Correctional Institute Letcher. And I did, yeah, I did end by saying I am, I think, 
at the moment fairly optimistic. I think I'd answer your question, Rachel, in two ways. One thing that has changed, which we only know because of movement-based research by lots of people a part of this coalition, is that the 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 nature of the nature of the formation behind the prison has changed pretty significantly, which we wouldn't know if we weren't really paying attention, right? So to be very clear, there was like a considerable, I would call it like a power block, a pretty cohered one behind the first iteration of the prison. It included the congressional representative for Eastern Kentucky, who's behind all of the prisons. His name is Hal Rogers. He's the longest serving Republican in the house. It included him. It included the Obama administration, the Bureau of Prisons under the Obama administration, lots of local power brokers, all kind of cohered together to build USP. Letcher, we, through, like I was saying before, through delay and various strategies, we effectively defeated it. This time around, that power block, I would say, does not exist. And it's a much more kind of fractured collection of people and agencies that are in contradiction with each other and sometimes within the same agency so to be very concrete every administration both trump and biden administration since 2017 have said they don't want the prison right the bureau of prisons itself this thing this still sort of baffles me that this can be possible but the bureau of prisons itself is simultaneously trying to build fci letcher right? That's the agency behind federal prison construction and operation. It's simultaneously trying to do that and saying it's not necessary and that they don't want to do it. So there's all that kind of shit happening. And it makes me optimistic because at every point of tension and contradiction, to me is a point of leverage, right? It's an opportunity to be like, you all don't make sense. Like you don't, you're, you clearly don't want this, right? Like, and and I think part of what is happening in the coalition is identifying those points of tension and contradiction and being like, there's people at these points to leverage against it, right? So there's people meeting with different representatives in the House to try and introduce floor amendments to rescind the funding, right? To get the funding pulled out. The It's now half a billion dollars, something like that. Um, people are meeting with all kinds of other like power brokers and elected officials in Eastern Kentucky to try and build up support. So there's that aspect of it, just like this at the level of sort of like the state, right? Or the PIC, which includes, of course, the state and some of these like quasi public actors, like the planning commissions and stuff like that, development districts. To me, it's like way more, it's way weaker than it was. And then the other thing is, is the coalition itself. Like I was saying before, first time around like i i think we were um there were tensions and you know and that we worked through those this time around it feels a lot more like deliberate intentional i think charlene brought this up before like sort of slow like having lots of conversations about how we want to kind of work together and build our capacity um and not just being responsive and so all those things together i think make me feel like um you know we it's on like like we're in a much better much stronger position this time around thank you for that question yeah thank you for the question rachel um and i, I have real specific answers <laughs> so um so to things we um conceded that we didn't have to concede or um mm -hmm. or i i would say like we we wouldn't have had to concede if we knew the uprisings of 2020 were happening, right? We had a bill filed before COVID happened and before um, people around the country and the world um, rose up in response to the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And we ultimately, the bill that passed was based on that. And because we had removed some things that we didn't think were possible before then, wasn't we weren't able to then put those things back into the bill that passed, right? So if um, one of the things that is front of mind for me is um, fees that get charged for pretrial conditions or services. If we had had the elimination of those fees in our draft earlier and not taken it out because we thought we couldn't pass the bill with it in that in there, um, then it would probably be the law. Um, 
and um, and I wrote a little bit about some things in the campaign in this online publication called Inquest. So I'll share that article too if it's helpful for people. And um, another thing I think of, and this is, it's not really an oversight. Uh, I think it was just maybe we didn't understand how um, the courts would act in the in the aftermath of our bill passing. So something that happened after um, the law passed was that the Illinois Supreme Court decided to create a statewide office of pretrial services, which in many cases um, look like pretrial probation officers and in instituting surveillance and conditions that can lead to violations and in general is a loss of liberty and privacy and dignity, but also can lead to violations that then directly put people back into the jail. Um, so that was something that happened in response. Um, and then more recently, actually just in the last month or two, that Office of Statewide Pretrial Services has created an electronic monitoring program and is now offering offering electronic monitoring to courts and judges in counties across the state, like predominantly rural counties or counties that are small towns that did not have those resources to electronically surveil people before. And none of that is mandated by the bill. None of it is conceived by bill, but it is an opening that the court saw and took in response to the bill. And it also was happening in what we've all experienced in our organizing in the context of what is a real increase in certain kinds of violent crime um, in the, the social and economic fallout of the pandemic and everything else. So there was also a very quickly, I think, after the bill passed a switch in the political context in which things were happening that um, law enforcement and others took advantage of to, to then fill in spaces or shift things in a way that, um, and, and I think there was, there were things years ago that sort of set the stage for this. It was always a plan to create statewide pretrial services in the state, but I think that the bill created the perfect option for the court to, to take that action. Thank you for that question, Rachel. And thanks, Judy and Sean, for your responses. I have one more question, and then we're going to take some of the ones that are in the Q&A. And folks, feel free to, to add questions in the Q&A. Um, but my question kind of has like two sides to it, um, which is, um, you know, what what is the relationship between the work of dismantling, of like stopping prisons and jails from being built, of taking power away from the from the police. Um, so that dismantle work and the work of building, of building up infrastructures, of addressing you know harm in, in ways that don't involve the PIC. Um, building up alternatives. Um, if if you all can speak a little bit to that, and the the kind of two partedness that I was speaking to is that I think you know uh, there's sometimes when I when I hear folks that are you know very strong in in their abolitionist kind of vision of a world without prisons and and policing and and rooted in that kind of um, uh, vision, um, but will be kind of more uh, timid around engaging in campaign work. Like you all talked about ways that you had to engage and confront the the state, right? Different state actors, um, traditional halls of power, um, and so there being more of a kind of. Uh, uh, a desire to do the kind of building work because it doesn't necessarily need to deal with the campaign work around policy and um, legislation or any of that, right? So if y'all can, if folks are are spurred to answer this question, I'm speaking to the relationship between dismantling and building. Yeah, 
I think Rachel should go first when she gave us that question. <laughs> All right. I, I have ideas about this, as Muhammad knows. Um, I think that it must be um, a dialectical relationship between eliminating the violent institutions of the punishment system, the violent practices of the punishment system, and um, making new ways of living together. I don't think they exist separately, right? So if we should be so lucky as to eliminate all locked cages um, and we haven't, we haven't been doing any practicing of how to welcome people home well or how to live with each other in ways that are not vengeful or retributive, then um, we've done part of the work, but not all of the work, right? Similarly, um, you know, we can build a million beautiful community gardens, but if we don't actively take on the violence of policing, if we don't actively try to eliminate the use of imprisonment, then they're just beautiful gardens, right? They need to be in relationship to each other. And um, I'll just say that kind of plain and simple. Campaigns are messy, right? And you know, putting these politics into practice in the real world um, is challenging. I won't act like it's not. And um, how to say, and at the same time, you know, that's how we win. And again, I'm going to use the word win because I don't mind winning. I think it would be great if we could all be winning all the time. But that's how we move toward our goals. The conditions don't shift unless we require them to shift. And, and that shift includes the elimination of obstacles in our way that would harm, kill, contain, and control us. They must be eliminated. And the conditions also require us to be able to have things in place that um, that are different ways of being, that do not have as the center of gravity, containment, control, and coercion. And that is not to suggest that there's a specific timeline on that, right? So that like on that happy day when X conditions are met, then we can eliminate imprisonment or policing, right? What I'm saying or what I'm trying to say is they both have to be in play all the time together and in relationship to each other. Awesome. Thank you so much for that response, Rachel. Um, I do want to uh, move to q and A. I want to pick out some of these questions. There's some really great questions that folks have asked. Um, so Rowan asks, all of these campaigns are big in scale and require long-term commitments. And I wonder if uh, y'all can speak to sustainability in projects like these, recognizing that lots of this work is unpaid, um, but that campaigns require a lot of time, effort. And so how do you keep the momentum going in these formations, especially when it's not your full-time job as paid organizers? I can try first to answer that with, without claiming I have any um, foolproof answers to it. And I, and I think actually there's a connection to a question you asked Mohammed about the relationship between the kinds of work that abolition wants to see done because I think one thing that um one thing that I believe deeply is that we obviously we need both everything Rachel said is so true and wise and also we don't all just because we need both doesn't mean we all have to do both or that we all have to do both at the same time and so I think allowing for different roles and allowing for some people's work in the movement to be different than the work that we do at a different time helps make things sustainable, like taking off the burden of especially, I think, newer organizers feeling like you have to do everything, um, or if you don't do it, no one will. And also our own work shifting over time. Like we can we can do the work of building new systems at one point and do the work of tearing down bad systems at another point. And I think 
um, allowing the space for people to do the work that feels life giving to them at a specific time is part of building um, more sustainable movements. And I think all that we sort of talked about the unsexy work and there's a question about the unsexy work. And I think stuffing folders and sorting t-shirts can be amazingly fulfilling and satisfying work when you are in a health, you're in a healthy coalition, you're in a healthy space, you're in healthy relationships and you're with people um, that you don't have to be best friends with, but that you're in struggle together and that there's um, recept there's there's care and there's respect there. And the only thing I'll say about the Harry paid and unpaid organizer thing is that in my experience, um, it can be really helpful to have folks who are paid that open up more time to devote to campaigns, especially campaigns that take years, but that there's a huge difference between uh, finding resources to pay someone who's an organizer on a campaign so that they have that time versus like getting money and giving it to an organization that then goes out and finds someone and hires someone to bring them into the campaign. And I've seen a lot of both of those things. Um, and I think that sometimes you get lucky with that second one, but a lot of times you get very different results than when you have a, a long-term organizer that you're trying to really figure out how they can support themselves and, and live and also keep doing that work on that campaign. Can I weigh in on this question? I'll try to keep it brief. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, I, I agree with Charlene. I also think that um, we should have the expectation that change at the scale that we're trying to make takes time and takes a lot of time. We also need to really have an understanding of the balance of power, right? Most of us are up against incredibly powerful forces, right? In Judah's case, against the United States government, right? Um, and so it's not going to be, you know, an overnight change probably. And so at the jump of any of these campaigns, we need to be thinking about the long term and we need to be thinking about um, the, the arc of a campaign so that we're preparing people up front. The other thing that I'll say is I think um, all of us talked about pretty broad based coalitions. And I know in the case of the Stop the Injunctions Coalition, exactly what Charlene was just talking about was really crucial for us. There was clarity around roles. Everybody didn't try to play every single position on the team, right? So it was like, what are you good at? What is your organization or your crew really best set up to do can we have you do that and do that well but not have the expectation that you are in every room making every decision at every single point and then finally i think um you know one thing that's really good for morale is clarity of purpose so if it is very very clear what you are up to and why you are up to it chances are better that you're going to be able to stay in the fight a lot longer. And I, I don't think necessarily that it's easier um, all the time for paid people either, right? I don't want to, you know, baby cry about how hard it is to be a paid organizer. But I do think that there's not necessarily an ease of having to be available 24 seven, which you are in, in some of these campaign situations. Um, and the work is not easier necessarily either. So I think, you know, having the, the paid and unpaid is a real, it's a real dynamic, it's a real tension. I don't wanna act like it's not true, but I feel like sometimes in our movements, we make a lot more of that than is necessary. And I think we create um, obstacles for ourselves that maybe we don't need to in the same way. Yeah, go for it, Judah. I was just going to say, I, I, this is very, very granular in response to, I think it was Rowan's question. I think like th there's an importance to like very practical kinds of conversations that you have in your organization or campaign. And I'm only just kind of realizing this now. I have two kids. Um, I do a lot of like meal stuff, extracurricular stuff, school stuff with them. 
and have been realizing in the context of the organizing over the last year for this new coalition that like the twice a week zoom meetings in the evening like that shit just like does not work with my life in this moment and it works fine it, well i don't want to make presumptions but i it does seem to work okay for other folks and that's fine and so i think to the points that charlene and rachel already just made like having some sense of having discussions amongst the group about what expectations are how people can plug in even if they can't make meetings you know to recognize that there's work outside of meetings whether it's like writing a press release or an op-ed or doing some background research or whatever um that like there are lots of ways that people can contribute to these kinds of campaigns and struggles some of that may in fact be showing up to a meeting a week or multiple meetings a week and for other folks that's just not realistic and i think it's really important a on the one hand to make the space for people who for all kinds of reasons kids or whatever um want to be in these spaces but need some kind of support and make the room for those folks to step back from certain kinds of activities and find ways for them to be activated um, in others and i think we saw a lot during the pandemic when everybody started digitally organizing you know just how many roles people can play even if they're not able to show up physically in the streets or they're not able to come to the meeting or whatever. And I think the good news is that a lot of those practices have continued even now that people are meeting in person again. And so um, that's, you know, like one set of things that I would say, but I, I would say each kind of coalition and each organization probably has sets of opportunities available and there's not probably a blanket response to that, but there probably are if you raise the question with the specific organization or within the specific coalition, plenty of work for everybody to do. You just kind of have to be able to articulate where you can get in and what, what you're best suited to do. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna ask one last quick question and um this one is from Lorkin. so love the idea that movements should be stronger after a campaign um how should how should that uh affect coalitions are we trying to build movement power campaign to campaign or can the coalition be completely different depending on the need I can jump in and try to answer quickly so that Judah and Rachel can also answer. I think I think that it's in the question, right? I think flexibility and um, really looking at campaigns individually, but knowing that you operate in an ecosystem, right? We're rooted in a place, parts like the vision of abolition includes the strong relationships needed to keep each other safe, right? So you might be in a coalition that ends or a, and there's a different coalition in the next campaign, but those relationships very likely are going to continue. And um, I, I think just, I think also over these last few years, like when so many of us have spent so much time online and there's so much vitriol online of like, we can't talk to each other in person. We can't treat each other in person the way that it sometimes feel like feels like people treat each other online um, because we're going to be hopefully together in different formations for a long time. Yeah, I think my perspective is that the point of a coalition is to try to achieve something together, not to maintain a coalition. So a coalition, I think, should have a specific purpose and should come together to do something pretty specific. And I think once the purpose is, you know, done, the coalition doesn't need to exist anymore. And in my experience, we hang on to coalitions frequently much longer than we need to, right? And so it's like, well, what should we do next? It's like, well, we don't have to do anything next together, but each of us should figure out, you know, what is our next fight? What is, what is um, the best use of our purpose and what do we need to get into? And to Charlene's point, maybe that means some of those players are in relationship again, but maybe it means some of them aren't. And I don't think there's any, any problem with that. I think that's part of the nature of coalitions. 
And yeah. with that, thank you. So okay. Oh, go ahead, Judah. Do you want to add last thoughts? Just to to underline Rachel's point, I think it makes a ton of sense. I think people come out on the other side of a coalition, recognizing that maybe that time has come to a complete, but to the point of the question as well, I think ideally some of those people are activated to see what might be the next fight as um, as part of like a newfound mission for themselves as well, right? So somebody who's a part of the current coalition to defeat uh, FCI Letcher, once that coalition or that campaign is done, I totally agree that coalition maybe should dissipate or whatever, go away. But ideally, a bunch of us will see the next fight, even if it's not in our respective community, as our fight as well, right? And so a new coalition forms that brings in new people, but that ideally takes some folks as well who now, in fact, see that as part of their fight. Thank you, Judah. And yeah, I think that perfectly speaks to the movement building aspect yeah. of getting more and more people engaged as we fight, right, for the long-term struggle. Um, we are at time, and I want to respect people's time. Thank you so much, Charlene, Rachel, Judah, for sharing your insights and providing such, such valuable contributions um, on this webinar. Um, I also want to thank um, Lixa and Lisa for your interpretation. And um, I also want to thank Viju and Shirley and Liz, who are CR members and staff behind the scenes, making sure that things go smoothly. Um, we are going to be sending out an email. We've recorded this uh, webinar, so we'll, we'll share a link to the recording. And um, we're going to share all of the different resources and links to things that people shared in the chat. Um, so you all will um, have those in your inboxes. Thank you so much for joining and hope you all have a good rest of your week into the weekend. Thanks, y'all.